A few months ago, I made a video about imperialism and how in the West we seem to actively try to pretend that the atrocities our ancestors carried out either didn't happen or else weren't as bad as they were in reality. Since then, I've had a few conversations with people who've argued that, yes, that's true, we did terrible things in the past, we should be ashamed, we should disown our ancestors. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that our world today is still affected by that, and it's unfair to hold people and nations today to the same standards as their ancestors, and certainly we shouldn't have to pay reparations to the ancestors of the people our ancestors fucked over. Hey, I'm happy to criticise what our country did in the past, but I didn't do that. Don't hold me accountable for their actions. <sighs> Okay, so I guess we're doing this then. What's that Lindsay Ellis quote again? The legacy of colonialism is baked into every facet of every culture on the planet. Oh yeah. So, let's talk about the legacy of colonialism, shall we? This argument actually comes in a couple of different forms, which I'll go through now. Other civilizations use slavery too, why aren't we talking about them? First, if the person you're talking to is white, they will usually come up with some variant of this argument. The historical civilization being compared or contrasted against the European slave trade varies, but it's usually somewhere non-white, and more often than not it's the Moorish or Barbary slave trade. Occasionally it's not exactly a civilization that's blamed for doing the same, but the slaves themselves, or the nations they came from that are to blame, for example if they rounded up people themselves to sell to the westerners. It Ignoring the fact that the Westerners created the demand for that to be even viable. Most hilariously invoked by Stefan Molyneux, who attempted to compare the slave trade with the drug trade, in the process confusingly comparing slaves to both the drug dealers and drugs. Most of the time this is done to assuage white guilt, or to deny or downplay the racial aspect of slavery. The obvious response to this is... Sure, I guess? But when we criticise Western imperial slavery, that's not to say anything about slavery being exclusive to one race, but that a race of people enslaved another race of people, and that is bad, which is true. The reason the European slave trade is seen as worse than the various other examples of slavery throughout history is complicated and varied, but to summarise... 1 the extent. Put simply, the scope of the European slave trade was enormous. I don't think it would be easy to underestimate it. Let's take Moorish slavery as a case study, but I want to emphasise that this can be used for every counter-argument I've ever come across. First, as with all these arguments, it cites a big number. Let's just Google it, shall we? Oh, look, here's the Wikipedia article, which contains the following. Middle East expert and researcher John Wright cautions that modern estimates are based on back calculations from human observation. Since no official records were ever kept, but the authorities of Ottoman or pre-Ottoman sources, observation across the late 1500s and early 1600s observers estimate that around 35,000 European slaves were held throughout this period on the Barbary coast, across Tripoli, Tunis, but mostly Algiers. The majority were sailors, particularly those who were English, taken with their ships, but others were fishermen and coastal villagers. However, most of these captives were people from lands close to Africa, particularly Italy. But okay, let's for the sake of argument accept that the probably incorrect 1.2 million figure is accurate. African slaves shipped to the Americas numbered around 12.4 5 million. I would say that whilst 2.5 million or even 35,000 people in slavery is clearly significant and obviously disgusting and unacceptable, 12.5 million is much more noteworthy and therefore more likely to be talked about. 2. The context. As mentioned here, Moorish slavery was based mostly on obtaining and buying slaves and pirates, whereas in order to get their slaves, the European powers colonised Africa, stole all the resources, brutalised the people, and then also stole the people and used them as slaves. I'm sure everyone is aware by now of the horrors committed in the imperialist years. If not, look up the dreadful things done in the Belgian Congo. Moorish slavery was opportunistic, whereas the European slave trade was simply an extent of the atrocities already being carried out, and in some cases was actually the motivating factor. 3 white supremacy. Most other slave-having cultures throughout history have certainly treated their slaves terribly, but as with the Moors, were equal opportunity monsters. The Europeans, however, specifically chose African slaves because they believed them to be subhuman and naturally subservient, as we see in multiple historical accounts from the time. The Moors enslaved 35,000 Europeans, and otherwise whoever else they could get their hands on, and the Europeans enslaved 12.5 million Africans specifically because they believed them to be subhuman. For the legacy. Following on from the previous point, it's clear that the legacy of European slavery still haunts the world. The African nations that lost their people, autonomy and resources are still among the poorest in the world. It's not a coincidence that the entire continent of Africa is struggling with this legacy after the West took all its shit, destabilised it and then left. And even within Western or First World countries, the legacy of slavery is not finished. America was where most of the slaves were taken, and for decades after slavery, black people in America were segregated and mistreated, followed by Jim Crow, etc. And even now, after 
MLK and civil rights, the culture sees black people as inherently inferior, portraying them as violent and animalistic in media, looking the other way when police shoot innocent black kids, electing an objectively racist president, etc. You get the point. The very fact that the European slave trade was conducted on such ideological grounds, where those who were enslaved were seen as inherently inferior based on race, means that those people's ancestors are still living with those same attitudes. But that doesn't explain why I have to atone for the sins of my ancestors. Because people are still suffering as a result of those sins. A billion people in the world today are malnourished and or without clean drinking water or adequate medicine today. That's one in seven, in case you didn't know. And hey, what do you know? All ten of the top ten most malnourished countries are ex-colonialised nations. I wonder if that's a coincidence. I covered this in my imperialism video, but I think the point is fairly obvious to be honest. The imperial powers stripped Africa of its resources, autonomy, people and wealth, and then whilst keeping all the enormous wealth that's generated for them and not bothering to return any of the resources they took, feel they have the right to turn around and say, but that happened so long ago, it wasn't even me who did it. This is all well and good to sit around arguing semantics, but the fact is that we in the West sit on a mountain of gold and skulls, though to be fair that money is mostly held by the capitalists, not the ordinary people whilst Africa and many other places besides are desperately trying to claw the way out of the holes left when we dug up their diamonds. That doesn't change because it happened a long time ago. And even within first world countries, there is a distinct difference in income and quality of life between white and non-white people. I would argue as a result of imperialism, as our society still views them as lesser than white people, and as a result, even black people living in western nations suffer some of the legacy of imperialism. We should look after our own first. Okay, first of all, we're not helping our own. Assuming you mean poor and homeless people within the west, then first of all fuck off, but also we don't help those people either way, so I don't see what your point is. Like I've been saying that we should redistribute wealth for years now, and the biggest pushback I get is from people who get all pissy about foreigners getting some of our money, even though in reality it's their money that we stole a few hundred years ago, because we should look after our own first, and it just pisses me off how clearly disingenuous this deflection is, because of course the people making this argument are, shockingly, not the same sort of people who are passionate about helping the homeless, or would perhaps agree with me that we should nationalise housing in an effort to completely eliminate it, because they don't actually care about looking after our own, they just like using it as a way to avoid having to deal with the issue. Homeless people to them are just a tool to be used and discarded as soon as the conversation moves on. If you were then to actually start talking about the homeless, they would pretty much immediately pivot to calling them lazy or one of the many other objections I spoke about in my video on the subject. But okay, maybe that's unfair. Maybe there are some people out there who care deeply for their fellow man, but only if that man is from the same arbitrarily defined portion of land as them. Maybe they are at the soup kitchen every week refusing to feed foreigners, who knows. I guess it's possible. Even if this was the case though, this argument is still utterly without merit. Why are our people more deserving and of higher priority than those in other countries? In making that statement, we necessarily now have to discuss a potential hierarchy of deserving poor, one that's based not on need, and of course the further down that road we go, the more problematic it becomes, because unlike my idea of a system based entirely on those in the greatest need, for example children without adequate access to food or clean drinking water, it's based on who is most like me. Because make no mistake, our own doesn't necessarily mean people who are born here. Sure, that's the way it starts, but in doing that you're already placing arguably xenophobic restrictions on the idea, so why would you stop there? Let's look at the most vulnerable people in British society, shall we? LGBT youth who've been thrown out of home by an intolerant family, immigrants or asylum seekers who are unable to stay in homeless hostels a lot of the time due to their country of origin, and single parent victims of domestic abuse. These are some of the people in the most need, so we'll start with trans teens who had to run away from home, shall we? Sort them out. Then the gay people who are rejected by their heavily religious families and we'll move on from there. Putting the people in the most need at the top of priority, as you suggested. I think you can see my point here. If you're the sort of person who hates foreigners, or at least thinks they're less deserving of help, then you're probably not going to be the sort of person who's okay with actually vulnerable people being prioritised. So then you'll have to put more and more restrictions on yourself until our own refers exclusively to straight white cis men. I don't know about you, but I've never met an enthusiastic nationalist who is passionate about trans rights. So if you make this argument, I think it should be pretty clear by now that you don't actually give a shit about helping people, you just want to use vulnerable people as a stick with which to beat off people actually trying to to do good work. Further, why should we as a nation prioritise ourselves over people who are arguably in more desperate need, especially when those people are only in such a dreadful situation because of us? We created their pain and we have the ability to end it incredibly easily, and yet we choose not to. And why? Well, it's a complicated answer which covers issues such as race, imperialism, and the superiority complex many of the Western nations seem to cling to, which is one of the driving forces behind Brexit, in case you were wondering, but one of the main reasons is capitalism. After all, under capitalism we're told, the strong and the smart and the hardest workers rise to the top and succeed, and this extends to nation states as well, and to the point where a lot of the time people will view third world countries, see the corruption, rampant poverty, and people in desperate need, and chalk it up to them not being competitive enough, or being bad at capitalism, and insisting that they pull themselves up by their bootstraps without hand 
Belts from the richer nations without acknowledging that they are this way due to the legacy of imperialism. Conclusion. If you're reduced to using these pathetic arguments in order to defend your position, then I'm afraid that I will think that you're kind of a fucking monster. It was our ancestors who caused the mess we're in, who committed these atrocities, who fucked up the world, and now it falls to us to fix it. First, of course, we have to tear down capitalism, abolish hierarchy, and get rid of all the borders, because the real reason this hasn't already been sorted, other than the sense of entitlement many people in the imperial nations seem to harbour, is that we are unable to organise in solidarity with our fellow people overseas across borders, that the money required to ease their suffering suffering is held by the rich, and the reason we can't just use the resources we have on earth to make sure everyone has a decent standard of living is because of the machinations of the capitalist heteropatriarchal hierarchy under which we live. We have all the resources we need to help those in need, and every child that dies due to malnutrition, thirst, or other preventable disease is a child who could be saved if we just worked together to rectify our ancestors' actions. Hi again everyone, uh, just a little thing to say, that as I've really enjoyed putting out this many videos in quick succession, I won't be able to keep that up for the foreseeable future because I've got a new job in another call centre but it'll pay the bills at least, and therefore I'll have much less time to spend making videos. I'll still do my best to put out one or two a month, but unfortunately I won't be able to keep knocking them out as I have done. I would take this opportunity to plug my Patreon and coffee pages with promises that if you pledge enough I'll be able to do this full time, but I think that's a long way off being likely and I don't want to promise something I can't deliver on, so if you want to donate the links are in the description, but don't feel like you have to, and for now I'm afraid we will be going back to less frequent videos, for which I apologise.